in years and, and have been afraid to get on that home because of uh, denutrition. So he helps with folks out. And uh, the park rangers came by. They were very interested in the idea of uh, uh, amateur radio. And they said they wanted to consider it as a backup for their uh, parks department radio. I caution them you can't use it for uh, for commercial purposes or business, but you can use it for emergency to uh, to their standards, uh, which is, uh, in other words, the guys who go out and get rough and tumble with the rigs. Supposedly, they built them to that standard. Uh, and they're $60, I think. Uh, only through Gigaparts. They partnered up with Gigaparts to get them produced and market. Uh, BVAR Cam Fest is on for March, as usual. BVAR is calling for volunteers from all clubs, papers from all clubs. If you're interested, get a hold of Rick Hiller. Uh, I've got. I don't, I don't want to write on the wall, but uh, I've got his uh, email here if anybody wants it. Uh, and this year, the Greater Houston Ham Fest will be slated as a Texas State Convention for ARRL. So that shows promise. They're working real hard to up their game for the Ham Fest. I've been watching some of the traffic and talking to a few of them. Uh, I was watching email traffic and talking to some of them. And they really want to improve it, up their game, get the vendors here more, reaching out to the makers organizations, the uh, makers community, get them there. They're going to have a kit build of some sort on Friday afternoon. They're going to have a youth group. At least that's the plan. We'll see if they, if they manage that. Uh, I think getting your looking at it, uh, I don't know if you know about this, but the off-road groups were looking gig up. Uh, every people here with Jason and uh, the off-road groups are introducing radio to the off-road groups, primarily now with GMRS, which seems to be the, the present-day CB. Yeah. But the idea behind this is between like, Jason and, and Giga is, if we can introduce them to GMRS, that's going to be a lot easier to uh, move them into a tech license. So I, I may suggest to them that they reach out to, and there's a lot of stuff with the off-road groups I think we need to look at, because they use 12 volts, they use uh, solar panels, they use a lot of stuff that we use. So I think there's a lot of synergies. A lot of overlap. A lot of overlap. A lot of them are into uh, pre uh, preppers, which would fit into our you know, emergency situation. I think there's a lot of synergies we need to work together with. Mm -hmm. That's right. And several <coughs> folks in the greater Houston area see that same thing. There's a lot of synergies to be had with different groups. And the Club of Clubs uh, is, uh, is getting organized. Uh, that is Houston Area Radio Club, HARC, the, uh, the old, uh, the original one for Houston, that uh, uh, their bylaws are still on record, they're still registered with ARRL, and we are uh, using that for the group. It's going to have a representative from any club that will come within 50 miles of Houston. Now, 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 the photo sent somebody too by Zoom to our last meeting. U of H has a, a very active ham radio club. We've got three people from that from that group that have been on our Zoom meetings. Uh, we had the first meeting; we had 30 people. The second one, we only had about 15, but there was a lot going on that week. Yes, sir. Just a quick mention about the U of H club. It just got started on the. They're getting people, uh, you know, at the university involved. And if you're familiar with Discord, the Discord platform, which is essentially like the old bulletin boards that we used to have, so that uh, that's what they're using. So you can go ahead and definitely uh, approach them. Uh, we can make the link available, at, at, you know, on the website or something uh, later. But the idea is that the sign up process for the U of H club is easy and that you're helping out the, the, this nascent effort over there, popularizing ham radio. And again, they're using the, the Discord platform, if you're familiar with that, so that's uh, that's something to, to look forward to. 
they again they it got started by one of those conversations on the uh, the uh, the stir crazy net at noon Monday through Friday if you're familiar with those and then it's uh, this one guy that says I, I want to start this he's got this interest is in uh, rocketry and doing telemetry tran uh, transmissions back and forth to the to the ascending rocket so that was his motivation but he's now come up with you know being the foundation member for uh, for the U of H Hamp Club. Uh, one of the other members is in the robotics. Uh, the three that I've met, all three are in the, in the School of Engineering, and they're very interested in several aspects. Uh, what's, what's going on? Now there's a uh, simulated emergency test in October. I think the first weekend of October, something okay. like that. Okay. Okay. We have, okay, from the Aries expectation, uh, I know a lot of times Houston moves it. Go ahead. Yeah, we move it. So I don't, we didn't, get, I didn't get anything from Sunday night. If we, once I hear something, or we hear something, the, the, the weekend we're going to do it, I will put something on a reflector. No. Okay, Zoom's not up. So what we're, but we usually move it a little bit later because of either so, um, we're still in hurricane season or cooler. <laughs> Also, too, night out. That might be another a way to get hand radio out. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else did I have on here? Uh, activity chairs. I promised everybody that I would assign liaisons to, for any activities that, for which nobody volunteered. Now, uh, Stephen volunteered for Winter Field Day. He'll, he'll be our chair for that. Uh, Barry did for, I wrote it down, Barry, <laughs> for bandpass filter build project. We've got, uh, Dom is going to give us a presentation either today or next time, depending on how our timing goes, uh, on radiograms. See, next month, next month, I don't have to carry it with me. Next month? Next month. Okay, that's fine. And, uh. I'm off the lanes on the area. <laughs> yeah, he is a liaison to Aries, and Je uh, Jeremy has offered to be our chair for Jamboree on the Air. Uh, there's a lot going on for Jamboree on the Air this year around Houston. I was surprised. For several years, I couldn't get anybody to even answer when I would send out a note to the various clubs about do anything for Jamboree on the Air. And right now, I'm seeing five stations in the, in the Houston area that are setting up. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, Texas City's one of them, uh, BVARC, uh, TAC, they're doing one. I don't remember who the, the other two were off the top of my head, but there were five. And uh, so that leaves Summerfield Day for next year. Uh, we'd like to have somebody pick that up. An antenna build or other activity at a club meeting and a DMR presentation. Uh, Summer field day. How? I don't know. Let's uh, talk about it. Okay. And that's okay. Yeah. Lot, I'm not, not going to force anybody. As long as I get, I will talk about it. I'm happy for now. Uh, DMR presentation. Anybody know anything about DMR? We've had several people ask me about it. Okay. We will call on the Echo Society. And see about getting them to help us out. Volunteer, Ralph. Yes. I've worked around DMR. I got the radios, and I've been working on it. And it seems like every time I get that thing programmed, it's working fine. Everything is working great. Somewhere in the DMR system above my pay grade, keeps changing it, and I have to keep going back down to the bottom again and restart over. Um, so I, that. But as far as getting the radios up and running, I've got that down. Okay. You're well practiced. Yeah, <laughs> getting to where I have done it too many times, and now my radio doesn't work anymore. I quit programming it. Yeah, we got Rick Broussard. He, he tried to do, uh, do a uh, yeah. our presentation because we just had one there at, at Echo, and that was pretty good. So we have a, we have the, you know, there's a DMR repeater here, and, uh, and have some hot spots and stuff that we can bring in, but it's more like understanding what DMR is going to be about. So, we, I, let me see if I can get Rick Broussard 
to come in here or at least run on Zoom because he's he's the administrator for several of the DMR websites around. And we need to do it by Zoom, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, hey guys, we're gonna go into the next room here where it's quiet for the testers. Yeah, my voice is kind of bouncing around yeah, in here. Loud in here, so just want to get these guys. Uh, what was the other thing we were mentioning? Oh, uh, the Echo Society sent me an email. I've been working with uh, a fellow from IEEE. He's a retiree who worked with, with IEEE. He is also a volunteer with the, uh, the uh, Sam Houston Area Council of Boy Scouts, which is the Greater Houston area, and he has been tabbed by, or tapped by National. BSA to organize some activities at the National Jamboree, which is June of next year. And it's going to be, it started as national, but they expect a lot of international folks also. And IEEE is pushing get amateur radio involved because it's such a stepping stone for the kids to so many different areas. So he called me. I've worked with this fellow several times on uh, for 20 years. Uh, different scout activities and he had, he had uh, caught wind of somebody up around Austin that had a zombie apocalypse on the air game time of kind of format he was doing with the boys up in Austin put them put it in a gaming format for the boys and problem solving and they took off with it so he's tried to contact a fella he's had a little bit of luck with it but uh, he uh, Walter, that's my friend, he called me and says, number one, can we get, do you think we can get support? If we get the boys interested at the Jamboree, can we get the ham radio operators across the country to mentor anybody who, who's interested? So I put out a lot of feelers and I've got a lot of affirmatives from different clubs, individuals, and a uh, fellow with ARRL, I gave Walter his contact for the scouting a liaison at, up at head, headquarters. He says, I love the idea, I'm busy, but you get a good framework put together, I'll support you, I'll put it out to the clubs. So we've got that going, and because I pose this as, you know, Jamboree on the Air is a stepping stone for next year's National Jamboree, that's when I started getting comments, hey, we're doing Jamboree on the Air this year. Uh, tell us what you're looking at, and we'll incorporate the ideas this year to prime the kids. So there's been a lot of good feedback on that. And Jeremy's been tied up with work. I need to get in touch with him. I, last time I talked with him, he was planning on setting up at the church that sponsors uh, the uh, Merit Badge uh, uh, Rodeo every year. And do... Fr uh, sa uh, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday for the Christians, Sunday for the uh, uh, traditional Jews. The, the, he's scoutmaster for a Jewish troop. And they are Orthodox, so they can't go on anything on Saturdays. So I've told him I'll be there to help. I need to make sure he heard me, remembered it, remembered that I offered. Uh, but if I get some information, when I get some information on where and when, I'll put out a blast to the reflector see who else might be interested in joining us or just being available at your home station to talk to the kids because you don't have to go anywhere just be on the air and yeah. listen for the boys now my favorite story uh, I'm sorry this involves my son uh, it's been over a year since he passed but it's still tough uh, when he was a Cub Scout, we did Jamboree on the Air in the uh, an old, old, old Scout hut over in uh, the Westbury area. I just threw some wires up in a tree, and another another guy brought his buddy pole, and he worked 40, I worked 20 meters and two meters, and we had the Cub Scouts there, and we finally the band opened up. It was awful for, for, for the morning, and just before lunch, it opened up, and I hear this, Beautiful British accent. Where have you guys been? We've been waiting to talk to somebody over there. Come on, boys, gather around. Now this is first grade to sixth grade here. Uh, and, we, and I get the first boy on, he says, my name is, and, get, and uh, of course I, I introduced him as third party under my license. He says, my name is, what's your name and where are you? Oh, my name is Stefan. 
we're camping. Oh, great, where are you camping? Sherwood Forest. <laughs> Not that one. And the boy, yeah. And the boy, the boy's going, wait, what, that's real? And yeah, the scout has to go, yeah, Sherwood Forest, Nottingham District, UK. That's where we are, it's real. <laughs> Every boy lined up to talk to Robin Hood's man. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we had this fellow who was about 6'5", skinny as a rail. I mean, if he turned sideways and stuck out his tongue, he looked like a zipper. Better was that you heard that one, isn't it? Uh, but uh, he got on and the fellow said he was in Norway. Well, this dad breaks. His parents came over from Norway. He spoke the language. We had a conversation back and forth with him and then helped translate between his boys and our boys. Wow, nice. Was that 40 meters that you're working on? Or? That was 20. 20, okay. So those kids are going to remember that on both sides of the pond. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're going to get. I was working two meters one time out at the uh, camp out at one of the parks and we were able to hit a repeater that was linked. And a guy comes back, hey, I'm an Eagle Scout. What's your rank? We talked a little while, and he says, by the way, I'm in Lubbock. I'm a truck driver, and I'm working mobile. Very good. Gave the kids the idea of what it's about. Excellent. So anyway, uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Sucker survives. That is a lot of dynamic pressure. <laughs> is, this one, is this one coming back in from landing then? Is that how that's going to like work? Splash down, the Pacific. splash down the Pacific. Now, it's booster rockets are going to be dumped off way before that. Right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You're going to have the initial. It'll come back in like the old Apollo did with the yeah. shield and everything else. Cool. Uh, hurricane. Uh, there is a low pressure system in the Caribbean. It's headed north northwest. Next About five years. days, they're expecting it maybe to reach the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, chance of formation for five days, 20%. So I think it's just more observation. Yeah. It's, it's weak system, low probability right now, but. You're right, this time of year, September 6 or 10 is the statistical peak of the, of the hurricane season. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got Martin is going to do a presentation on uh, his childhood rigs. And <laughs> the World War II vintage radios. So, uh, uh, any, any other business? Yeah, you want to get the gallery report? Yes, please do. Oh, uh, another one is I'm going to send this around first. Uh, yeah, then get to get ranked in here. Uh, this is showing sales time. Okay, if you ever watched uh, some of the English YouTube YouTubers for Ham Radio, I'm specifically speaking here of DX Commander Tower. <coughs> Uh, he is a uh, ham radio operator, he's a pilot, he's a musician. And what part of his thing is to get, uh, he sends all his input and output audio signals through what's called over there an equalizer. In the United States, we call them mixers. Okay, what I was looking for one day was a system to where I can take several radio inputs and put them through a earphone. You know, I can switch one, or I can, you know, listen to all of them or switch one of them out. Well, those things are not exactly, the thing was, the cost between that and this was minimal. Now, now there is a store, it's called uh, Sam, Ash, Sam, Sam Ash Store, it's on I-45, Southbound Peter between West Road and West and uh, 249, and they sell these things. You can also get these on uh, eBay or whatever. The thing is, this store knows what, you, what uh, they realize I'm a ham. The guy that re I was working with, he even realized, he even knew, he wasn't a ham, but he knew that ICOM microphones are different from other types. So, I mean, th these people know what they're, do what they're doing. And the nice thing about this is, if you been on HF recently, it's been like a jet taking off all the time, background noise. Yeah. With a mixer, you can push your buttons here and you can filter out some of that noise. 
So even if you have a uh, entry level rig, if you got uh, or your your low powered rig or a 703 or an older rig that doesn't have all the signal processing uh, from signal uh, for uh, audio, this might be something for you to look at. It's a great idea. It's a great okay. Idea. Second of all, I've talked to Ralph about Galveston, and over the three years. The world has changed immensely, even about COVID. As you know, on July the 4th, there was a incident at a parade. It was a sniper attack. And this has always been a concern with me over the past 10 years on the island. Uh, because during 10 years ago, I took my mom to a Civil War demo. There was, there, it was a Civil War, major Civil War battle on the Galveston Island which nobody talks about, but anyway, I don't want to go into weeds, but the thing was, I, you know, my mom, I got my mother set up in a wheelchair, and I kind of told her, I said, you know, we got to be, be careful with that. We said, what was the roof? There could be a, a truck shooter. They said, sniper. Guess what, when that scenario began, the first shot was a sniper on a roof. And of course, they were using blanks. If you know anything about Galveston, during the Civil War period, those buildings were used for that purpose, for, you know, watching for things out in the Gulf. And my thing is, knowing that, number one, the world has changed, high capacity crowds, uh, we're looking at a possible, let's say somebody shot, started shooting in the Strand for any event, and with a high capacity incident like the Strand, we could be, all of us could be in a situation of a mass casualty incident. And I think the other thing is that I think the clubs need to start looking at this. If we start volunteering for some of these groups, this for me, yeah. I don't say anybody else has to do what I do, but any place you go that you feel threatened, don't go if you don't want to. But the club right. doesn't volunteer anybody. It offers opportunity for people to volunteer. And then everybody makes their own personal choice on that, always. So the club is not responsible ever. If you volunteer, you're volunteering as an individual. Well, there's not just Galveston PD down there. They have a bunch of officers from HPD and a lot of other places down there. It's a big community thing where a bunch of officers show up. Phil, though, I mean, the long and short of it is that uh, Dom and I cannot recommend that as a club we sponsor an activity down there for the uh, Dickens on the Strand. Uh, it's not to say if anybody wants to, they, they, they can't, you know, they can go if they want. If, if you want to take some of my uh, sounders, little Morse code sounders and blinker lights, you're welcome to them. I've got posters you're welcome to. Just that at a club, we're not going to recommend them. That's and then, well, the thing, the other, uh, and then, uh, yeah, this is uh, just too, too many things that are, to me, are questionable. And uh, I, like I said, we tested each other for a long period of time, and I did, and I think our thing was, you agreed with me, but we wanted to inform the club about, about uh, how we were gonna handle this. And so my thing is, I'm just gonna send a letter down there saying that uh, our club has been is refocusing closer into the Houston area. I don't, we have it just that way, yeah. Yeah, and so. The, uh, I will let the, uh, the other clubs that are in the uh, uh, Greater Houston Area Club uh, know about the uh, possible opportunity. It's up to them. But I, I, I um, so that's my two. Um, two oh yeah, the SCT. We know I haven't heard anything from from Aries. Well, like I said, once I hear, I will put on the reflector. Yeah, I think well, the, the one time that I attended it, the uh, the official SCT was like first weekend of October, but. We didn't have anything here until uh, right before Thanksgiving. Yeah, and, and sometimes too, in case we do get a storm, uh, the officials will call that the set. Yeah. So, thank and you. We're fortunate that here we've got uh, uh, one greater pro uh, greater use of propagation net that is set up to uh, link everybody together in case the uh, uh, repeaters go down. And we've got at least two other small localized uh, simplex nets that are in operation. One down in my part of town. I understand there's one up uh, getting started in Heights. Don't know. Really? About. That's a rumor. Just a rumor, okay? Okay. The, uh, 
So be uh, always be ready. Okay. Uh, anybody have other business before we get going? Stephen. Hey Ralph, uh, I know I didn't send you an email about it. There's a couple of very quick videos I was gonna show you, show the team. And I've um, also got a bunch of projects I've been working on. I can show them at this time or we can do it later. Let's, okay. let's do it after Don. Uh, there he is, Martin. Down here. <laughs> I'm looking for you. Uh, <laughs> after Martin does his, we'll see how much time we have. Sounds good. Good, only 9.30. Go ahead, Martin. All right. So lots of talk about digital this and digital that. Uh, this presentation's got nothing digital to do with it at all. Um, this is um, the British Army wireless set number 19. Um, it was made, this one was made actually in the United States in uh, 1942 by National. Um, and it holds the accolade of being the first ever single tune transceiver. Um, now, why was it made? Well, it's generally accepted that the, the tank had played a, a big part, hang on one second, a big part in, um, there we go, in winning World War One. Just give me one second, guys. See what I'm doing here. There we go. <clears throat> what, what, what happened after World War One, in between World War One and 1939 for England, 1942 for America, and World War Two, is there wasn't really a lot of development, and it was not possible to put a transmitter and receiver in a tank because basically they were just too darn big, um, and there was no actual transceiver either. Um, so, in 1939-1940. Uh, um, the British War Office, who saw this kind of coming, um, commissioned a company called PYE, P -Y -E, who went on to be quite a big leader in um, police and first responder communications in Europe, uh, commissioned them to build the 19 set. So basically what you've got is a, the first single tune HF transceiver, designed primarily to go in a tank. Um, they were originally used in the British Churchill tank uh, and also in the uh, British Matilda tank but also by the United States later on in the war. One second. And it is horrible. You, you get thrown around all over the place. So Lord knows what the World War I tanks were. So this had to withstand uh, basically being, well, shipped across the Channel if it was D-Day, shipped across the Mediterranean if it was North Africa, um, and bumped around all over the show. So more of that in a minute. Okay. They were made up until 1952. Um, and this is, this is the tech spec for what it's worth. So you've got actually two transceivers in here. Um, just very briefly, if you look at from basically from here on, you have an A set, which has basically got two frequency ranges, two to four and four to eight megs. It, they're AM or CW or modulated CW. There is a BFO in here. And then there's a VHF part. And this is actually one of the first ever, um, certainly European VHF sets. Um, that came out at uh, 229 to 241. Why two sets? Why two sets? Well, there's a great demo of this. There's a movie called uh, A Bridge Too Far, which is about Operation Market Garden in September 44. And there's a lovely shot, which I almost took off of my DVD copy, of Michael Caine as tank commander, British tank commander, leading off his troops. And he's got in his hand one of these because these, were, these are a carbon microphone. They're not around anymore. I don't know whether I can show it to you. But the way the carbon microphone works is it puts a low voltage, hang on a second, through this, which is an insert. This is an old one, actually. But this insert is just full of literally carbon or graphite granules. They get excited, they generate a current, and that's a, then it goes straight in here into a transformer. Um, a common modification for these, by the way, one which I've done myself, um, is to build a breakout box which goes on the end of these funny connectors um, so that you can actually put a, a more traditional um, electric microphone or condenser microphone into it. But you've got to have a preamp to do it. And the way it worked was these little control boxes here, um, you had one that was up at the top of the tank with the commander, another one which was with the driver, 
and the commander could switch at will between the A set, the two to eight links, and the B set. Why two sets? Well, the idea of the A set, right, which was putting out you know, 10 watts if you're lucky, was to talk to division, brigade, regimental headquarters on, the, on HF. The idea of the VHF set was quite a novel idea because it was only 300 milliwatts, it had a range of less than a thousand yards, and this was basically so that the tank commander, the lead tank commander, could talk to his other tanks. And you think about it, I mean, this is a real dilemma for the forces during the 30s that, you know, they could, that at one point, somewhere around about the mid 30s, the British Army was signaling between tanks using semaphore flags. You know what they did in the Navy, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, signal lamps as well, all this lamps, I think um, they're called somewhere, not that they use on ships, that as well. So you can imagine that, that in order to do that, these guys had to have line of sight. And if you didn't have line of sight, you, you were basically screwed, right? So that's, it was a huge breakthrough when, when this started. Okay, let's move on. Wartime roles, um, as I said, it, it, it was used primarily, the first big use was in the, um, the North African campaign, but it was used throughout World War II. There's a derivative of this that um, later on in the war, after Market Garden, which I'll get to in a second, they brought out a version of this without the VHF set in. In this box, which is the power unit, this runs off 12 volts, there's a dynamotor, right, which makes a hell of a racket and is quite heavy. So what they did was to take out the VHF section of this and then put in a vibrator, uh, which delivered the uh, HT for the, um, for the output valves and the heater currents, etc., etc., etc. That was called a 22 set, um, and, uh, it, it, it was, but it was basically just putting what, should, what this does into there. So that Translation, right. valve is a tune. Oh, I'm sorry, tune, <laughs> valves, my apologies, all right. Forgive me, all right. Tunes, I'll try and remember. All right, North Africa. Um, all right, here's the med. Spain's up here. It's at these over here somewhere. About there, actually. Um, and you can see that it was, it was highly successful in North Africa for both the British Army and also for the Canadians and the US Army, because this was the first time that the US Army had actually shipped troops and equipment over to Europe as part of World War II. But, but, bear in mind, you can't see very very uh, clearly here, but bear in mind the terrain, because the terrain becomes very important here. This is some, just some shots I've got, I, I found on the web, of the way that these uh, were used. These are actually in-tank installations. And you can see that, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to North Africa, but if you take a look at some of the movies that go around, or documentaries about Rommel, or the British General Montgomery, you'll see that it's desert. There's the Atlas Mountains at the back of it, but basically it's mostly dead flat. Note, there are no trees, so it performed very, very well. It was then used for Market Garden and for D-Day. So we're now looking at June 44. So you can see here, they've modified it to go into a US Army Jeep. Um, and it was solid, solidly built enough to be dropped from C-47s, right, for Market Garden. Um, not all of them survived, but you imagine taking an ICOM 9700 and dropping it from an air from a C-47, even though it's padded. No chance, absolutely no way. Um, this thing survived it, or at least I'm told it did, whatever. However, there was a problem. It, it didn't do so well. And again, if you look at a bridge too far, you'll see a lot of reference to uh, what they call the army signals, the radio part, being a, a, a problem. And the problem was this. Right? This is a, a shot of Normandy. This is inland from the D-Day beaches, from Omaha Beach. And this, this type of countryside is called Bocage. And if you can imagine a waffle, right? And you take a look at the indentations on a waffle being a field, and the raised bits, the square bits on the waffle being hedgerows, that's what these are. And they've been there for hundreds of years. Um, the, the US forces, the uh, US Army, actually modified the Sherman and welded on a kind of a, I don't know what you call it, some kind of snow plow. Hmm? Sort of like a plow. Like yeah, like a plow. plow. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, so that it could, and what they did was literally to ram in to the bocage here, right, or th these routes, and so they'd go up because obviously with these, they were for defensive positions, they were ideal for the Wehrmacht, for the German army. Now, the problem was, of course, that difference between North Africa and Europe, 
there's trees, there's hills, there's mount well, little mountains, there's, it's, it's not flat desert. So a lot of the signals issues that were on D-Day, which are actually publicized in regimental memoirs, but are not generally publicized to the outside world, and especially with Market Garden. Um, a, a good example being that um, with Market Garden, they, what they tried was there was an external crystal oscillator which would plug into this. It used to plug into one of these sockets here. And they tried this. They could not coordinate the crystals. You'd think that, you know, the idea being that, you know, crystals, you should be spot on. Everybody should be on the same frequency. Um, unfortunately, British Army signals made a real mess of it. Um, and that, combined with reception issues, and remember the antenna for the, the 19 set was literally a, a, a copper, I think it was eight foot long whip, right, which normally went on the tanks. They did a little bit better um, when it went into jeeps, and it was used occasionally as a base station. <coughs> um, if you watch the movie The Battle of Britain, uh, on the opening scene where the, uh, the Germans uh, chase the RAF out of northern France, you'll see they actually, it's a cheat because they weren't actually being made then, but there's a 19 set sitting there with a, a little whip area on, on the top of it. So, post-World War II, <laughs> this is kind of, I, 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 I kind of, this always fascinates me. 3,000 of them were sold by the British government at 40 bucks, well, the equivalent of 40 bucks a tonne. They were sold by weight, okay? 2,000, about, were buried, right, in, in a field somewhere in England. And this, crazy as it sounds, um, is, was quite common. There was another um, set that was made over here by um, RCA, called an AR-88, which was the big communication receiver that they used for monitoring secret transmissions, more of that in a minute. Um, and they, these things weigh 110 pounds. I've actually got one sitting at home and I can't lift it on my own. I have to have you know, the person to lift it with me. Um, and they just dug a, a big hole. If they couldn't sell them, they dug a big hole and they just poured them all in there. I don't know where they are. Nobody, nobody seems to find them. Obviously, they're all rotted away now. But coming a bit more close to home, um, the remainder here were allocated to what in England is called a combined cadet force. Over here, I think it's called ROTC. And what this is, this is a cadet force that's schoolboys. Um, we, you, most of the private schools, we call them public schools in England, but they in effect private schools, um, had a cadet force. I, I was in it, in the signals bit. Um, and these, there was established in the 50s um, uh, allocated frequencies for CCFs, cadets, to use. So they were given a 19 set, trained in signals. And the whole idea, remember, that national service still existed in England up until 1958. So, you know, it's 13 years after the war's end. So there were two frequencies that they were generally used, uh, 4030 megs, which was called Whiskey Lima, and 5.33, which is called Delta Oscar. The reason I'm telling you that will become apparent in a moment, if I, if you, if I may. And the CCF network, was, it, it had some commonality with the, with the way we work as amateurs. Um, QSL cards, um, the, these, I just pulled these off the web. But uh, as you can see, this is a, a grammar school, which would be a, a high school of, um, in, uh, in, over here. It's in Leicestershire, Loughborough, which is about 100 odd miles yeah. north of London. Um, you can see it's using a 19 set Mark III, that's only a Mark II with a 100 foot infant there. There are about 72 of these, um, two or three character call signs, cards, um, together with authentication codes. So my, the call sign at the school that I was at was 32 Alpha, 32A. There was another school close by, which was a college which just had six, um, and that's the way they did it. The authentication codes were issued monthly to the schools and were literally uh, two letter so, for example, we'd say authenticate Alpha Bravo. You look it up on the table, and the response to Alpha Bravo should be Charlie Delta, for example, and that was it. No changed every month, right? And the reason I'm telling you this, there is there, there is a there's some logic behind all this. So, give you an idea what it is. So, but also many of them, right, were bought by hands in Europe and Canada. And as you can see, this is the best I could do, Ralph, to get a Ralph look-alike here, and the best I could do to get a Steve look-alike and a Jeremy look-alike here. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, you can see, basically, again, you know, a lot of people, you, there's a lot still in use. Now, what, what might be of interest here is this unit here, because after the fiasco with Market Garden and a few other things, um, <clears throat> Pi Radio, people who made it originally, 
made a linear app, right? And this basically bumps up the output to 100 watts. Um, it throws TVI, television interference, all over the place, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, these linear amps are incredibly rare. I've been trying to get hold of one for at least five years. Um, the cheapest I've seen is one in Holland, that was going for almost $1,200, which is not worth it. Um, but um, they are very, very, very hard to get. You, know, you wouldn't find them on eBay very often. All right. And again, in use worldwide. Um, I, I've actually worked on, not recently, but worked on field days with them for contesting. And there's a lot of military radio clubs in Europe, especially in Holland, in the Netherlands. This particular one is in Canada, some while ago. Um, this one in New Zealand. Um, this one, I think, was the UK. Um, and I mentioned earlier that there was a derivative of the set with, uh, without the uh, power supply. That, that's the 22 set there. And uh, this was also a signal generator, which uh, actually went with the kit. It was kind of a complete a complete package. All right. So I'm going to digress for a minute, but I, the, the, bear with me because this relates to this particular set, which I was given as a Christmas present in 1967. Right, so I was about 15 years old. All right. This is Caversham Park. It's an English stately home. There's been, it's actually there's been a building there for over a thousand years, but not this building. And it's about 35 miles west of London. Why is this important? Well, there's a link to this set, which I'll come to in a moment, but geography, geography, geography. Right. The BBC bought this in 1939 as a wartime monitoring station. Um, and it, it actually was in, in action up until six months ago when they finally closed it down because technology over, overtook it. This is part of the antenna farm that's no longer there. It was one of the best antenna farms I, I've ever seen. Uh, there's also a, a, a Yagi here as well, but these are basically dipoles. And it is, the BBC did a huge survey around the country, and they found that the, the location of this, Cavisham Park, at the top of the Thames Valley, the River Thames runs through Reading, which is the nearest town, um, was one of the best reception areas they could find in the entire country. Right? Now, I'll tell you how good this, this really was, right? As I noted here, the next level, if you looked east, the next piece of ground level taking the horizon into account was, was the Russian steppes. So you literally had, well, kind of line of sight, but you had nothing obstructing you except the horizon between 35 miles west of London and the Russian steppes. Now, when I was at school, a friend of mine's mother was one of the Russian monitors, that's what they called them. They, the, the way that the monitoring station worked they listened to the, the, usually an AM station or an HF station, translated into a, a teletype machine. Uh, that then went to an editor, right, who would then uh, figure out where, where the, the information would go. Is it, was it government information? Was it secret information? Was it the news, the nine o'clock radio news, which would go out with the BBC or six o'clock, nine o'clock? Um, I have stood in that monitoring room and listened to two Russian tank commanders on exercise just up near the Finnish border, so way, way up in the north of Europe. They were having trouble hearing each other. We could hear both of them <laughs> clear wow. as daylight. Unbelievable. Right? I mean, it, really, really good stuff. What so, year was that? Hmm? What year? This would, well, I would have been in about 60, 66, 67, something like that. That's when I would have been listening. All right. Also notable is what's known as the beverage antenna. Not very well known at the moment, you know, presently, but used to be used a hell of a lot. And this is one of the fields from Cavisham Park here. Beverage antenna was basically designed back in, I think it's 1920 or 21, and it was basically designed for intercontinental monitoring of AM stations. Now, another thing that I have, I've actually heard sitting in, um, in, in Cavisham Park, in the monitoring room, is listening to, at night, listening to US medium wave broadcast stations. Now, I, I, I have never experienced that before or since anywhere else. And this is largely because of the, the beverage aerials, uh, antennas, I'm sorry. There we go. They were long, they were very long. And the, to give you an idea as to how seriously the BBC took this, um, no cars, were allowed within one mile, right, of Cavisham Park because of motor interference, spark plug interference, right? It's the old days, remember. 
Um, there were um, obviously no cell phones or anything at the time. There were no actual landlines in the monitoring rooms. Everything went to a separate area in the basement before it actually went out on landlines to the BBC Bush House in London, which is where it was recycled. Um, in addition, by the way, Cavisham Park was this shady organization called the Federal Broadcast Intelligence Service, the FBIS. Um, this was the forerunner of what goes on at Langley now. Um, is Langley where the NSA is? Yeah, we, uh, the, the, that, that, this kind of thing. Uh, this is just some various shots of it. Obviously, the, the uh, antennas were taken down when, the te when satellite technology took over. Um, there's, these were the dishes. There's now just one left, which, of course, is now non-operational. This is part of the recording. This is a later shot in the 60s. These are cassette recorders. Um, so basically, they, what they did was to record everything as well as monitor it live. This is one of the earlier shots. This is uh, back in, uh, I think this is just post-war. Um, and here, um, you can see again, this is where they're actually uh, measuring the signal. There was no transmission, um, or none that I know of, uh, from Cavisham Park, but uh, obviously it was a, a receiving station. All right, so what, <laughs> what's this gonna do with my 19 set? Well, it's all about TV, British TV in the 60s, all right? And again, bear with me, all right? Two channels, BBC and ITV, stands for Independent Television, all right? Now, the BBC was funded by a license fee. So, when you bought your television, in fact, you didn't buy it, but when you rented it, right, then <coughs> you, a, a note was sent to the post office, the general post office who actually administered this, um, that you had to get a license, right? There were, was and is no cable in England. There are actually little bit few isolated cable um, uh, uh, rigs in, uh, in new towns, but when I was around, there was no cable. And it was VHF, and look at the frequency, right in the middle of the six meter band, right? Six meter band didn't exist then, and this is where, and it was 405 lines, right? As opposed to at least 1080 or 4K or whatever we've got now. Um, very few households in the UK owned a TV, right? People rented them. You, 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 it was quite normal to rent, and this included the royal family. Um, I've, actually, I've actually worked with Princess Margaret when she was alive, um, and, and delivered her a rented 26-inch Ferguson, that was the British-made television. And the reason for this is twofold, because in the United States at the time, television transmission was NTSC, that was the colour standard, standard for uh, National Television Standards Committee, or for the rest of us, never twice the same colour, right? In England and in Europe, we had PAL, Failure's Alternate Line, right? Or, if you prefer, Pictures at Last. Um, the only exception being France and Iran, who had CCAM. Uh, CCAM, I can't remember the actual one, but it says, same in every colour as the Americans, we, we, we kind of cover, used to cover it. And the reason for this was foreign exchange. Foreign exchange was, and uh, uh, imports were a very sensitive issue in, in, uh, in Europe after the war. Nobody wanted, in England, nobody wanted to import Zenith or RCA or Magnavox or anything like that because it would mean foreign currency. Nobody wanted, the French were even more so. Um, that they, uh, when, for example, the first Saudi Arabian Air Force, which was formed back in the uh, early 70s, uh, was, was sold by France, right, on the condition that Thompson CFF, CSF, a big French company, sold them a television system. So they, they got the French system, which actually gave rise to a whole load of complications later on. Uh, luckily now we don't have to worry about this stuff because we've got digital, that those colour standards now don't. But at the time, they were extremely important. All right, how did people, what happened if you didn't buy a licence? Well, this happened. <coughs> um, this is something which I don't think ever, ever existed in the United States, but these are the dreaded TV detector bands run by the post office. This is a more recent one, of course. Um, this is, again, this is TV, but this is a 60s radio detector band. Because remember that one thing that we don't kind of really have to worry about nowadays is what we call RFI, television interference, TF, TFI, TVI, um, television interference. But remember, we were talking about six meter band. We're talking about a set that was made when there was no television, basically. Um, so why worry about TVI? Why worry about spewing out harmonics? You know, and, and believe me, this, 
This is you'd have more money. So man with about like this. Huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So that, that was a now. So what happened, right? And the, the link between the two goes back to Cavisham Park, right? Here is Cavisham Park again. But uh, here's the grounds. This square here is where the antenna farm used to be. You can just about see the satellite dish which replaced it, which is now no longer there, of course. And this here is a bomb crater, by the way. This is the only bomb that dropped on Reading during uh, World War II. Right? Why? What's the connection between this and this? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, what had happened was, now go, this is where I, I, I told you about the, the uh, ROTC, CCA. But there was no hard and fast rule that the CCF transceivers or the station should be operated within the school. Right? You could you could go out on you know onto you go to a park like you know transition to a park or wherever. So there was really it was arguable as to whether you could actually use this in, in anywhere basically. So I had fired this up at home this this set at home. Um, with a piece of wire strung down the garden. Um, didn't do very much with it, just went on a, a Saturday morning CCF net, um, said hi to a few people, um, and that was it. But it wasn't it. <laughs> because I was throwing out a harmonic right on top of Radio Moscow. And the BBC monitors, right, immediately, I mean, this was kind of important stuff, immediately notified the post office who operated those detector vans who, who had come round, monitored me, and I had a knock on the door uh, one evening by two very... Randy Lakey got you. Yeah, yeah, they got me. They got me very quickly as well. Um, and um, they were very nice. Uh, they, were, they were really pleasant. But they did confiscate the set. Uh, um, so that, that uh, literally my father was instructed or they came up into my bedroom where it was on the second floor of the house, then a small house, and uh, literally pulled the plug on it and, uh, and, and that was it. So I, that was the end of that. It wasn't quite the end of that because it actually had quite a, an impact on my career. I spent the first 12 years of my working life working for the British Security Services and uh, one, of the, 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 one of the two guys who came round to actually do this had left a card asking me, you know, like, uh, said to my father, remember I was only 16 or 17 at the time, um, you know, when your son goes off to college and all that, you know, perhaps he might like to consider working for, um, you know, th these organisations in the signal spark, which in, in, in effect I did. So this is 1967, right? And it, now, I, by this time, 69, I'd gone off to college 200 miles away. And then from there, I'd moved to London, etc., etc. I hadn't gone home, put it that way. Without my knowledge, the set was returned in 1974. My dad obviously pissed at me for having got it and been raided or whatever. Um, had put it in the garage. Um, he passed away in 2006. My wife and I, we, I was living in Houston. We went over uh, to look after my mum. And guess what? I was in the garage and this covered in straw and cobwebs and all the rest of it was my trusty 19 set. So shipped it over to Houston in a container in 2010 with all our other effects. And since then, I uh, have done a, a not complete, but almost complete uh, refurbishment on it. Um, and, sorry, where are we? Oh, it's over there. That, that, that's really all I need. Have, have you uh, made contacts with it since it's been in Houston? No, no, I'm not licensed to. Um, the, uh, it, it does work, uh, it's functional. I've made a couple of minor modifications. You'll see here we've got PLs, uh, PL259s. Luckily, I managed to find two, a, a type of PL259, which has got the same diameter as the original fitments, which I've retained. Um, there's a couple of little cabling changes in there. Lots of capacitors changed here. Um, this was making a dreadful noise when I fired it up. Um, so what, what happens with these things is a lot of the capacitors in here are paper, dielectric. It's dried up. It's no longer, it's not capaciting anything, basically. Um, so, and I've, I've still got to do a little bit more work on this. Did you follow uh, it up with Ariac? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, I said, sorry, no, I didn't. Uh, with this, it basically, I just, 12 volts, just put a 12 volt battery on it. Um, um, gave it a good clean. Um, I, I had some uh, compressed air, which I had to go lock here. And there was also some WD 40 and some uh, alcohol went on here as well. What amazed me is that this thing 
I don't know where it went in 1967. Presumably some warehouse of confiscated equipment or, or whatever. And uh, lo and behold, after having been in that warehouse, stuck in my parents' garage, shipped in a container five and a half thousand miles over to here, st stuck in my garage for a couple of years before I actually got round to fixing it, um, plugged it in. And there was only one thing I had to do. There was a dry joint on one of the 12 volt connections in here that I didn't notice. I couldn't figure out why I was not getting power. Um, and anyway, after it was hidden, it's hidden behind a load of sockets. Um, resoldered that, resoldered that, and, uh, and it worked first time. So there you are, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's a, a, a different aspect to amateur radio and a little bit of, of, of technical stuff as well. Feel free to come down and play. One question. When Patton was going across Europe from France to Germany toward Munich, were these in his tanks? Yes. Yes. The that's the set my dad worked on. He, he was Radio Corps repairman. Really? He, it would have been this or the what they called the 22 set, the one without the VHF bit. But okay. if it was a tank, it was almost certainly a 19 set. Uh, you said something very interesting, and it just hit me. You said that there was like three variations of Mark One, Mark Two, Mark Three. It seems like that's the, the, this marking thing is it's not the common radio because the ICOM 706, there was a Mark One, Mark Two, like Mark II G, so is that must be a, a designation of a variation of a model. It's just a military. It's a military term, basically. The reason for the, we, the different marks on this was the Mark One was a little bit more basic than this and had, had it had some stability issues and stuff like that. The Mark. What happened is that when it was realised that the British British industry just didn't have the capacity to make as many of these sets as were needed for the war effort. That's when it went over to Canada, when it came over here, right, and they started making. So the, the natural thing, as soon as the, the, the presumably the Canadian, the, the US designers got hold of it, was to say, yeah, we can do better than this. We, and, and they did. Um, they, they, this is actually a, a, better, a much better set than the Mark I. Um, these, by the way, these are a US pair of uh, headphones. The, the UK ones all without the, uh, uh, the pads and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so that, that, and the Mark III was, was, again, just modifications they improved the power, improved the efficiency, sensitivity was increased. Um, you wouldn't really notice it, to be honest with you. Uh, that you. You're talking about uh, trade restrictions <coughs> after World War II. I heard that Brit Rail, British Rail, actually wanted to buy locomotives from in the government to acquire these on it because it was not a British product. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and there are kind of, I mean, the, the, the biggest example is probably what happened after the end of World War II. And I can't remember the name of the act, but it was an act of Congress where the US government would no longer share any atomic secrets with the UK, even though the, the, the actual team under Oppenheimer on the Manhattan Project were like 50 or 40 or 50 percent Brits, right? Unfortunately, also the guy who gave it up, I forget the guy's name, but the spy who, who actually gave up on the atomic secrets also part of the British team, or whatever. Um, and after that, that was when it started. But it was also the fact that Britain was bankrupt. In 1945, we had two world wars in 35 years, right? And the country, I mean, I was born in 52, and I still remember when I was four years old, bananas, seeing my first ever banana, right? And quite a revelation. You know, the boat came in. I lived in a port town in South England. And it, I mean, we literally went down there to see the bananas coming in. It was like that. Because they came from the Caribbean, and the Caribbean, you know, everything was redirected, sugar was redirected to the armed services, right? Likewise, chocolate. Right? I didn't see a bar of chocolate until I was five years old. Right? And, and the whole reason for this is because, obviously, what England Britain wanted to do was to not basically spend what little foreign currency we had, or exchange it for foreign currency, both with the Europeans and, of course, over here. And there's a lot of politics. I mean, if, any, if you're of any interest to anyone that... The politics around the way television came about in Europe and the US, uh, it, it, it literally is it's riddled with corruption. Um, these large electronics companies, Thorny MI in England, um, RCA Victor National, um, Zenith and a few others, Philips in, um, in Holland, in, in the Netherlands, all of them, Thompson CSF in France, Telefunken in Germany, all of them vying 
right, for television contracts because they knew how lucrative it would be. Think about it. If you were able to install a transmission system in a country where, for example, the separation between the sound and the vision signal, which was normally in England it was 6 megs, in Europe it was 5.5, and it varied elsewhere. If you were able to then make that different and also make small differences to the, the way colour was uh, decoded, then you've got yourself a market. You've got yourself a captive market. Um, and, and that was the idea. Um, I can now do on that computer and my phone, we all can do it, on that computer and my phone, what used to cost me when I used to work in television, anything up to a thousand bucks an hour to do. Standards conversion, for example, from American NTSC to PAL required a, a, a box bigger than that, um, and which cost many thousands of dollars. Um, and now, of course, you know, if we go onto YouTube, no matter where you are, so that's the difference. Was there a rental box on top of the TV for No, 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 it was done differently. Um, the, the, you, you rented, there were about half a dozen different chain stores that rented TVs. Um, from memory, about three pounds a week, which was translated to about, say about six bucks. Would they so, do that at a hotel or something? Have a television? No, no, you didn't have that. Um, what happened, that there were license, types of license for hotels and for groups. But the way it used to work was that when you took delivery of your, your TV from the rental company, you signed a form, which was a government form, off that went, this is before computers of course, so off that went to some sorting centre, and you were given I think 30 days to pay your licence, um, and it's still going on by the way, I mean people don't rent anymore, those import restrictions are now you know, something of the past, but um, those detector vans I showed you, they're still around, um, and what they used to do, they had to change them, they used to detect the oscillations from the high voltage right, in the TV, the anode voltage, right, and, and uh, the, the, panel, uh, the line transformer, from memory, I think, something like that, um, but they, they could literally drive past your house, and if they, if they got a buzz, yeah, then you, you, in, in British parlance, you're nicked, you know, and so that was it. Um, but, um, and even now, um, and by the way, the TV license is nothing to quite show about. I think uh, last time I checked, £150, uh, just over $220 a year. No, so, um, and they, they're, they're kind of things like seniors, we call them pensioners in England, but, but seniors and certificate reductions, that sort of thing. But they, it, it is still in force. Um, and the, the only thing they got, a, they, they got around was uh, using TVs in car, because nobody anticipated the flat screen. Alpha Charlie 9 Ocean, Whiskey 2, Whiskey Fox Truck, Echo Lima 29. Whiskey 5 Charlie question mark. Come back again, Bravo Fox Truck. QSL, QSL, Whiskey 5, Charlie Bravo Foxtrot from Whiskey 2, Whiskey Foxtrot, Echo Lima 29, QSL. QSL, Echo Lima 29, thank you. Thank you. Whiskey 2, Whiskey Foxtrot, Kilo India 5, Topog Golf Lima, Echo Mike 13. 
Kilo India 5 Papa Golf Lima Whiskey 2 Whiskey Fox Truck Echo Lima 29 QSL Kilo India 5 Papa Golf Lima QSL Kilo 